Hello, I'm Chris Anderson. Welcome to the TED Interview, the podcast series which starts where a TED Talk ends. Today, we're talking about company culture and the crucial importance of ideas like empathy, authenticity, and trust, and the need for leaders to, well, to stop making it all about them. Francis Frey is a professor of technology and operations management at Harvard Business School. But most people know her as a culture consultant. Francis has helped make over some of the world's most controversial brands, Riot Games, Uber, and most recently WeWork, at times when trust within those companies was at a low. If you don't totally reveal that I get you, I see you, and I'm doing this for you, then nobody is going to trust you and you're already lowering the bounds of how much you're going to get out of everyone. So trust is necessary, it's not sufficient, but it is the necessary first step. We'll get an intimate look at how and why Frances took on these companies and how her methods apply to everyone in the office and outside. So, Frances Frey, welcome. Thank you so much. So, Frances, tell us a bit more about you and what it was like growing up. What did you imagine you would be when you grew up? Oh, golly. (laughs) So I grew up in a small town, uh, six kids. I was the youngest, uh, born when my mother was 25. Our household income was, I'm sure, the median income of the nation. Went to public schools, didn't go to restaurants. Uh, First time I ever got on an airplane was with my college basketball team, and we flew to play a competitor. There wasn't the expectation that I would go on to do anything near what I'm doing now. I was good at sports, and I was pretty smart. But in retrospect, I'd look back, I'd say I was super-duper restless, but had no guidance for what to do with it. And so what did lead you on the journey that you've ended up taking? Yeah, so when I ended up at college, and I, I applied to like 17 schools and got into just a very small handful of them. One of them I got into I had never visited. I didn't really even know what it was or what it meant. The school's name was Brandeis. And I went up there for a year and was pretty miserable, I think because everyone else was there for a very precise reason. I just didn't really understand what I was doing there. A big difference happened when I decided to applied to the University of Pennsylvania to transfer there. I was a good basketball player, and so I played on the basketball team there. I was a math major, but I also got really into studying computer science. I had communities there. I didn't feel like I had to fit in there because it was a large urban campus. I really started to be myself. And did that being yourself include coming out at that at that time as gay? Yeah, you know... Um, I don't ever remember coming out. Um, I was pretty uninterested in either boyfriends or girlfriends, and I started to have girlfriends in college. But I don't actually ever remember having the quiet conversation. I have to tell you something, you might be surprised. I think I tried to have one or two of those conversations, and people looked at me like I was saying I'm, you know, from New York. Like, it didn't make any sense why I was even bringing it up. But it was the first time I ever had romantic partnerships. I mean, one of the things that's so striking about you is you have this sort of fearlessness to you that is, it is extremely compelling. Um, And I'm wondering where where that came from. It sounds like that there were times at school and uh, in early work environments where you didn't feel fearless. You felt you know, like you were trying to navigate difficult situations, but you've got this, you, you've you've got this um, willingness to come out and speak truth in a very powerful and f- often funny but compelling way. I mean, how how did you develop that skill set? Well, I don't recommend the path I took, but I I think I did go through quite a difficult path and came out the other side and was of the never again type of feeling for it. So I think I did go through periods of feeling powerless. And I think when I got to the other side of that, something switched in me and it was literally never going to happen again. I mean, I don't have to screw up courage to speak the truth. My inclination is to speak the truth. I mean, I have to screw up courage to go to a a cocktail party because that's like 
totally torture for me. That's so interesting because I I would not have guessed that about you. Uh, seeing you in action, it feels like you're completely assured in company. There's nothing you'd rather love than to go to a cocktail party and um, oh you know. my gosh, you have no idea the lengths <laughs> I'll go to get out of it. No idea. Mm. So you ended up at Harvard as a in, in a teaching role. Talk talk about that. How did that happen? And um, what sticks out from your your time doing that? Well, I think the important thing to realize is that Harvard said no to me five times. They said no to me when I applied out of high school to college, applied out of college for a PhD program. First time I applied to be on the faculty right out of, I got my PhD at Wharton and applied there. First time I went up for tenure, they said, you know, take a minute, et cetera. Et cetera. So I've had, always had a strong sense that my values and the values that appeared to me that Harvard stood for, which was to educate leaders so that they can make a difference, always seemed right to me. I have a very hard time condemning what I call mortals for making a bad decision. I'm sure I've made bad decisions, but I certainly don't let their bad decision dictate my future in any meaningful way. When anyone would say no to me, I'd be like, okay, so I'm just going to take that as not now, and I'll come back later. And then I think I was right in the sense that it feels like such a natural place for me. I'm, like my status quo is authentic with logic, with empathy. It just feels, it feels like a really, really lovely home. But then on the side, I guess, is the right way to say it. You, you've taken these roles at um, at least two headline-making companies that most people might want to run a million miles from, and yet you you took the risk and embraced them. Um, first, first of all, Uber, and then more recently, um, WeWork, I think, during an absolutely traumatic time there. Are you attracted to kind of roadkill or I know what, what accounts for that? Uh, so for Uber, I, I did take a leave of absence from HBS, which if you had asked me years before, would I ever take a leave of absence from HBS, I would have said no. But the situation there, somebody asked me to go and meet with Travis, and I was expecting not to like Travis because I had read everything that was in the newspaper. This was, I joined full-time in June of 2017, but it was a couple months before that. I totally liked him. I totally thought he was a good person. I totally thought he was trying to do the right thing, and he was like, look, I need help, and I need help in these two specific areas, in leadership and in strategy. And it wasn't, I didn't think, that Travis didn't understand the strategy, but he was having a hard time getting it baked inside the minds of the employees. And, you know, somebody that's humble enough to say, I messed up, I need help in the areas that it looked to me, those were the areas that he needed help in. And then he gave me full discretion to help in those areas. But then I also wanted to meet the employees. So I think I met before I started 1,500 of the 15,000 employees. And I liked all of them. They were really mission-driven, really wanted to do the right thing. So I thought, okay, I consider this a very noble product because it's, you know, my grandmother is driving her last car and super-duper worried about what's going to happen afterwards and is she going to all of a sudden have to become dependent on people With Uber, she doesn't. She just now has an app. So liberating grandmothers around the world is a pretty phenomenal thing in my mind. I need nobility. I really like things that are hard. And I like things that uniquely require me. If someone else can do it, I will leave immediately. Anne and I talked, my wife and I talked, uh, my kids and I talked about, I was going to leave HBS. I wasn't going to move to San Francisco because Cambridge is really just ideal for my family. But I commuted every week, which was, that was very hard, taking a Monday morning flight and a Friday evening flight back. But it was a great, um, I loved it. And what happened in June at Uber is pretty similar to what happened in September and October at WeWork, although I think very different contexts. But as soon as you have the change mandate, What we quickly learn is that there's not 15,000 bad people. There's just 20 people who just can't be here anymore. And 
I think that that is a, something that's quite in common with the two places. And then I see a really optimistic way forward for both of them. I saw it for Uber then, and I totally see it for WeWork now. Wow. So let's come on to WeWork in a minute. But I, I um, what was striking to me, one of the things that was striking to me about Uber was just you could imagine someone coming into, I don't know, a consultancy role there or something and giving advice and, you know, sort of, not fully embracing it. You embraced it. I mean, you showed up in a, I, I think you pledged that you would wear an Uber t-shirt every every day pretty much until yes. you felt that the cultural issues had been fixed. Like if you really want to show authentic commitment and build trust, wow, that's that's a very dramatic way to do that. And and it it is who I am. I'm an all-in sort of person. You know, I originally thought no way. And then when I went, I thought it required all of me to change it. I didn't think I would be successful if it was part of me. I mean, one of the big sticks on Uber was, you know, that the company's cultural attitude towards women was was really problematic. Did you have a bunch of women contacting you and, and saying, Francis, what are you doing? This is the enemy. Why? Well, you should not be here. Well, I had everyone contacting me thinking I was out of my mind, but not mostly women, just People that were worried about things like personal brand and, I mean, people trusted that if I was going there, I was going to make it better. But they thought maybe I was being too naive going there. I didn't get much going with the enemy there because it was really early. I got a lot of you're crazy and are you sure you know what you're getting into? But, you know, I got there and I knew if we could fix things at a place that it looks like they're so bad and could go either way. I think we give license to every single other organization on the planet to fix things because they won't be as bad. So I went there with the full intention of making things better here as an inspiration that they could be made better anywhere else, or at least a removing of the excuses that it couldn't be done anywhere else. And what do you think is the biggest single thing that you moved at uh, Uber? Well, I don't think any of the things that you would have read about in the paper, I think they would be as close to impossible to occur now as a company can be. There's no longer any of that behavior tolerated. So even if you don't do it, I think if you hear of that behavior, it will get surfaced immediately. And we've set the conditions for good people to work really hard. I think now the challenges are strategic, which is quite honestly awesome. Now they're competing on what they should be competing on. But I believe that the cultural problems are as um, gone as anyone could claim they're gone. Something could always happen tomorrow, but probability is super low. So talk about WeWork. And like, was that a similar situation? Because... Adam Newman was still CEO, I think, at the time you joined there. Did did he reach out to you? And was that also an experience we felt? Um, I actually like aspects of this person quite a lot. Uh, Jen Barrett reached out to me in December of last year. She's the co-president, general counsel, and several other things at the company. Really an extraordinary executive. She reached out to me and said, one of our pillars is trust. I think we're losing trust amongst each other. We're not getting the benefit of that. We're having a very broad gathering. Would you come and talk to, you know, 1,500 of us at once? So I went and spent three or three and a half hours with 1,500 folks that they call in the community area. Those are if you go into a WeWork building, these are the people that will be interacting with you. And I fell in love with them. Oh, my goodness. They were so service-oriented. They were so empathetic, really mission-driven about helping people. And my wife had previously started a company and used a WeWork office, so I knew how much she liked that environment. So that went very well. And then she said, will you come and help us do several things? But one is to enhance trust between all of the constituents in the organization and then some other awesome things. I said, yes. So I came at a very optimistic time. It was in like February or March. And so we were working on really bold, ambitious things until, well, we still are, but it got, um, then then the things happened around going public. 
And that was the first time, you know, I had read about any of those things. And I still don't know all of the details behind it, although there's more resolution literally today than there was 48 hours ago. Um, I mean, it feels like it's so interesting. Like, companies are such complex entities. Um, like a lot of people who've had contact with the company feel like at least part of the story there was that an ego kind of got a bit out of control and almost, um, like, in a way, the fundamental story of WeWork was an empathetic story. It's we are doing this together. But perhaps there was something inauthentic, at least on in, in part, about that and that um, it blinded people to being realistic about the dreams and perhaps too much, even too much money invested in it may have played a role, right, in that instance? I have to say, I, th- I think you're on to something there. The, and I'm an operations professor, so excess bothers me. And I would now say quite definitively, is there, su- is there such a thing as too much money? And yes, in this context. Um, but I would also say that the company was and still is, like, built on empathy, and it's empathy for the people who come into the buildings every day. And that's that's unchanged. I think there's a broad lesson there. I would never go to a company that was mostly poisonous. But in my experience, when the vast, vast majority of the company is doing well, and there's just some people for whatever reason – for whatever version of the Milgram experiment brought out not the best in them, when that number is relatively small, I'm super-duper optimistic about what's going to happen going forward. So, um, I mean, for people who don't know the story of WeWork, they were about to go public at a huge valuation north of $40 billion. Analysts looked at the numbers, didn't like a lot of what they saw, didn't like what they saw as some self-dealing, and... um, crash, the opportunity to go public went, the valuation plunged, and and uh, some people were laid off. And it's it's sort of, it's become, um, there's almost been a pylon, would, would you say, of, of uh, Twitter punditry or whatever, of sort of, um, oh, we always knew this was a disaster in, in the making, that must be incredibly hard to live through on the other side. And, you know, when you're, when you're in it, you think that that employee base, that group of people there can weather this and reemerge, maybe a little humbler with slightly less grandiose dreams, but with, with still something powerful to do in the world? Uh, without question. And I think that the employee base is quite humble and grandiose in how many people they want to contagiously reach. But I think that absolutely the best days of it are in front of it. But I'm super optimistic in what it can do because I watch the service it delivers I see the employees that are doing it. Now, it's going through a tumultuous time. Well, if I had a company that was in trouble, Francis, I, I think I would. you would be in the first person to call to <laughs> come, and, come and speak. You're very eloquent. And um, um, I'm, you know, I think those, those were generous words. Um, we're going to go on an exploration together about how to make life at work more satisfying, more interesting, more productive, more wonderful. And uh, it's a topic of relevance to everyone, I think. There, there are stats out there about how miserable most people are about their work, right? Absolutely. And some of, them, some of the statistics are quite startling. Like 70%, I think I've seen quite 70% of people really say they are not satisfied at work. Not engaged. Level below satisfaction. So that's a recipe for a miserable life. It's, it's not right. It is. And, and the optimist in me will immediately come out and... If we can sweep away what's getting in the way and have to identify if it's pebbles or boulders, and I think it's pebbles, look at how much better things can be tomorrow than they are today. I mean, what would you say is the main reason or couple of reasons why why people just feel dissatisfied in, at what they work at? So I think one of the reasons is that we have not engaged employees in ways that feel meaningful to them. So... If we ask employees to do routinized work and we don't have it a context around their lives for why they're doing it, or if we have a lot of job ambiguity, so on the one hand it's routinized work, on the other hand it's you come in, you're not really sure what you're supposed to do today. At the end of the day, you don't really know if you did a good job or not. You have like this persistent job anxiety, which means you have this persistent, am I going to get fired anxiety you're surprised at the end of the year when you hear your evaluation could have gone either way. 
and you didn't know until the end of the year how it went. So we're, if it were deliberate, we are beautifully designing a system so that we will get as little as possible out of employees. Turns out people want to know why they're doing something. I mean, it's, it's kind of amazing, isn't it, that for a long time, many businesses were set up not paying any attention to that at all. The assumption is you're lucky to have a job, you, you know, you're getting paid, don't stop grumbling and, uh, and do what you're told. And it almost seems like some businesses have never deeply moved beyond that. And I'm not sure that it's always that attribution. It, I think that people haven't known how to unleash the magic of the full capacity of employees. And so, you know, you write out your strategy, you write out your plans, it shows you need this many people doing this many things, and so you just set them out doing it without perhaps honoring the humanity of the people that are doing it. And without honoring the humanity of people that are doing it, you don't realize that you can get three, four, five X from them if you approach it differently. So how much of the problem do you solve just by communicating clearly, hey, our company isn't just here to make money for someone else. Uh, we actually have a valuable social mission. This is what that mission is. Now get on with your job. How, how much does that solve? I think that would move the needle not at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what moves the needle? Um, first, I think you have to build a foundation of trust with people. Because when you're moving your lips and saying things, people are really watching a lot other. They're listening to you a little bit. So I think that they have to believe the person who just said that is saying it with deep authenticity. It's not that they're saying this to us, but when they go into the board, they say, don't worry about that social mission. Yeah, this was the topic of your that wonderful TED Talk you you, you gave. Indeed. Three, three pillars, right? <laughs> yeah. So authenticity, logic, and empathy. And the empathy is for the other people. If you don't totally reveal that I get you, I see you, and I'm doing this for you, then nobody is going to trust you and you're already lowering the bounds of how much you're going to get out of everyone. So trust is necessary. It's not sufficient, but it is the necessary first step. I'd love to just dig into it a little more because I, I think the, the talk was super compelling and those three pillars are really interesting. I mean, they, they to some extent, they live in dynamic tension with each other. Can we just dive into them in, in a little more detail? So the, the thesis is, in order for you as someone at work, maybe a leader, maybe anyone at work, to win someone else's trust, you have to have these three things on your side, authenticity, logic, and empathy. So start with the empathy piece there. Sure. So if, if while I'm talking to a group of people, if they sense that I'm in it for me, largely, and that they are an afterthought, or when their interests overline with my interests, it works— but if we sniff out that you're largely self-interested as opposed to interested for the people that you're talking to, that makes the difference between whether or not I'll trust you. So if you're on my side, if you empathetically, you get what I'm going through, like you really get my perspective, you took the time to understand my perspective. If you get that and the other two right, people will trust you. And the way you can think about trust is you get enormous benefit of the doubt. And it just, it just accelerates everything else you want to do. But empathy is, it's like it, it seems obviously right that empathy matters, but really hard to do in practice. Like it's not enough just to, to smile and say, I feel your pain. It's, it's, um, oh, yeah. no, no. <laughs> so let me give you a great example. So in a meeting, everyone in a meeting is showing whether or not they are interested in everyone else or themselves every minute of the meeting. Purest test in 2019, are you looking at your personal technology? Because it's impossible to look at your personal technology and also to claim you have empathy. Because you are clearly thinking of yourself over everyone else in the room. Now, that's one small example, but it's, that's a, a metaphor for how this works. Are you demonstrating that the other people are more important to you than you are? But if you're in a, say you're in a meeting with 12 people, I mean, that's a lot of people, and you're a busy person. Like, how do you actually build the tools to care about the interests of, of the people there? What shifts from just being, okay, I should do that, to actually feeling it? I mean, unless you feel it, it's not empathy, right? Well, I think, so I think that um, not bringing your technology with you is good because you may have a addictive reaction to it. Watching what people are saying, revealing that you are listening to them. If someone is hitting an obstacle, having your own mind 
a resonant example that could help overcome that obstacle. You do it either in the meeting or outside of the meeting. So usually what happens is we pay attention in meetings until we get it. And then we endure while everyone else gets it. Well, instead of enduring, which is a low empathy activity, we actually actively sought to help other people get it. That's a high empathy activity. We've also found that it can bring two-hour meetings to one-hour meetings or one-hour meetings to 30-minute meetings when everyone agrees on that behavior. And is it just in, in a way, obvious things, but so often ignored, like speaking less and encouraging others to speak more? So many meetings dominated by two or three loud voices. Yes, it's, it's for sure. You can reveal you have low empathy by being less interested in what other people have to say, being primarily interested in what you have to say. That, that makes it very difficult to communicate empathy, unless what you're talking about is entirely about other people. So talk about the logic pillar. What do, what do you mean by yeah. that? So the logic is that, you know, if you believe that I'm in it for you, you really shouldn't have faith in what I'm doing unless it makes, like, really good, rigorous sense. That's what logic is. Would you be letting me draw the map to where we're going? Like, do you have faith in my reasoning, which is what I mean by logic? And what we have found is that it's really hard for people to have faith in your logic if you don't give them some amount of transparency to it. Trust me, I'll do it doesn't work anymore. So we have to give enough transparency so that you can, for yourself, believe in the logic. It's why organizations today have to describe far more of their business models to their youngest employees than they ever did in the past. Do you have any examples of that, of, of like going wrong? Of <laughs> being managers oh, who've going just... wrong. Golly, yes. Um, for example, pick any organization you like and go and ask the front line of the organization, you know, what's the strategy of the company? And you will find that people may look at you blankly. Those that answer, you'll get 10 different answers. That's an example that we didn't take the time for people to understand the logic. We may have said some words, but contrast that with go to Walmart and ask any one of the million employees what the strategy is of the company. Every one of them will be able to tell it to you. So logic is giving people tools to really n not just know and proclaim a fact, but to have a structure in which it's embedded, why, why it makes sense. It's anchored in something that they get. And... Um, makes sense. So I'm, I now have extra trust in you. you. I think you care about me. You've told me something that makes sense. That I, I get that combination really well. But then come on to this third one, authenticity, because in some ways it seems there are circumstances where authenticity can fight empathy a bit. Because, um, I mean, as, as I understand, authenticity is not being afraid to be who you are, but that means that's the focus on you. You've described sometimes how your almost your empathy stopped you yourself from being authentic. Can you can you talk about how those two things play against each other? Sure. And so so if the authenticity is to be yourself and the thought behind that is that we can tell like at a moment's glance whether you are truly being yourself or you're faking it in some way. And the faking it could be you were ashamed to bring your difference forward, or faking it could be your boss gave you a message, you're delivering the message, you didn't believe in the message. You're trying to state the message, but everyone can hear you didn't believe in it more than the words are saying that you believe in it. The lack of authenticity is what makes trust go away. Now, the presence of authenticity, you know, sometimes I'm so empathetic to your context, and I can see exactly what you want to hear. And so it's super tempting to then try to be that person what, that you want to hear. The trouble with that is that even if it feels good in the moment, it's not going to help anyone in the long run. So I'm not saying there's not a great temptation to do it. I'm just saying that it's not a great idea to do it. I mean, tell me a story from your own life of where you've wrestled with how to show your authentic self. I mean, you know, growing up in business and in, in academia, it was awfully tempting to fit in. So when I got to the Harvard Business School, there was lore about what Harvard Business School faculty did, it, how they dressed, how they comported themselves, what their family units looked like. And it was pretty textbook amongst all of them. And there was no one 
for me to role model against. Um, in the beginning, I didn't think, oh, awesome, I'm bringing difference here. I am sure I'm going to get celebrated for it. Instead, what I think is, golly, I'm bringing difference here. Let me try to mute it as much as possible. And I even got very kind signaling of, oh, you might not want to do that. You might, in retrospect, you might want to be less of you. You don't have to be fake, but trim the edges of who you are. Don't have such strong convictions. Because I knew these people loved me and wanted me to succeed, I would listen to it. And that, I think, elongated my journey. It didn't help. And that's that's almost what I meant by asking about like your your willingness to empathize with them and to really hear them almost almost got in the way of your own authenticity. And I'm, I'm curious, like it feels to me like you want to say that you can embrace both to the full. How do you embrace both to the full? I definitely want to say that. And it wasn't necessarily my empathy for them. Or, although I guess it is. I really like that. I hadn't, I hadn't considered it before. It was also, though, that I had faith in their empathy towards me, that they were thinking of what's best for me. They just weren't correct, uh, which is, I find, often the case when it comes to difference. We know how to coach people who are like us. We're typically pretty lousy coaches with people who are not like us. Um, I mean, I do want us to be our authentic selves, realize that the unique things about us are the most interesting things about us, and that this notion of fitting in is really quite a tragic bit of coaching. Let's come on to the book that you and your wife have been writing. Um, first of all, actually, tell us what it's like writing a book with your spouse. That's that's something that a lot of people wouldn't dare do. <laughs> yeah, so our marriage uh, works well with big projects. So our first big project was me getting tenure. Our next one was our first son. Then a book then our second son, then a company together, and now a book. So our marriage is strongest when we have the privilege and the opportunity to work on something really hard together. So an ideal weekend for us is when we find the time and space to work together um, or when we can steal. We both get up pretty early in the morning. We steal time before everyone wakes up to do this. Um, we worked very hard on the TED Talk. Uh, in, in fact, that got to such things that Anne would hand it off to me at 10 a.m. I'd work on it until 2 a.m., have it back in her inbox before she would wake up and we would go around and around. <laughs> Goodness me. Please convey to Anne my apologies. <laughs> <laughs> she, it's a beautiful moment in our marriage. Um, but tell, tell me a bit more about, about her because um, th this, this sounds like uh, an extraordinary relationship. Tell me about Anne. Oh, so she, um, you know, I joke with audiences, but I mean it sincerely. If you have the opportunity, please marry up. And what I mean by in marrying up is that Anne is a person that everyone, everyone wants to be a better person when they're around her. And she's so generous. Her goal on the planet is to make other people better. She has a keen insight into leadership. She's had really extraordinary leadership roles since she was 14. And she's also a beautiful writer. So she's an extraordinary business. She's a serial entrepreneur. I try to earn the right to be married to her every day. Um, I also married up, by the way, and I thoroughly recommend that as well. I completely, completely concur with you. Tell us about this book. It's called Unleashed and is publishing sometime in the spring. Is that right? June 2nd, 2020. The subtitle is The Unapologetic Leader's Guide to Empowering Everyone Around You. And it's based on the premise that leadership, and we believe leadership can occur certainly by senior leaders in an organization, but that every one of us can engage in acts of leadership. Leadership is about making other people better as a result of our presence and then being clever enough to figure out how to have that last into our absence. Hmm. So that's, that's really worth um, lingering on because that's not what people first think of when they think of leaders. You know, people think of leaders as the charismatic 
presence on the stage or the person striding around the office. And that picture is often, you know, it is about the person leading other people's job is to follow. You're, you've got a very different model here where you said the leader's job is to help others do better. Talk, talk more about that. Yeah. And that charismatic person may well be able to make others better, although they high probability that they may be too self-distracted to do that. But if you just think about it in terms of numbers, like let's say I'm awesome and I can do this much as an individual contributor. Imagine what else I can do if I got everyone else to get in touch with their awesomeness and then the people that interact with them to get in touch with their awesomeness. So it's my awesomeness versus the you know, ripple effect of what other people can do. There's no comparison. So the way of thinking about it when it's about you, it's so limiting. And I think that there's still enormous competitive advantage to be had in any industry if you simply get in touch with other people's awesomeness. <laughs> I mean, a traditional view of leadership might be that, yes, there's an important role to delegate and to, you know, know what you, what what others would do better than you and to be clear about what others should do, but that, you know, someone's got to come up with the key ideas about where this company should go or where this team should go. But but so you're not just talking about delegation, you're talking about actually in the ideation process in, in everything to bring others in and give them a chance to shine. I'll do that test all day, every day. Put your guy in a soundproof room and let him come up with the ideas and I'll put someone in a room with all of the other people they've empowered. We'll thump you. <laughs> so talk about how, how someone actually does that empowering. I mean, empowering is a word I I keep getting drawn to. And, and I and, and then I sometimes shudder and say, does that sound really corporate? Is that a boring word? I mean, in many ways, that's what you're talking about. Is It's the, it's the secret source of empowering others. How? How do, you, how do you do this? You do it first for your presence. Like, it's, I'm going to make you better, but it's okay for you to be reliant on me while you're going to get better. But I want you to be able to do it in my absence as quickly as possible. And there's like, so there's a set of things I do in the presence, which I'll tell you. And then there's a set of things I do to make me completely obsolete in your eyes. So the presence won't surprise you that foundation one is trust. So I have no chance of unleashing you if I can't build a trusting relationship with you. So I both have to have you have faith in my authenticity, logic, and empathy, but I have to teach you how to have other people have faith in your authenticity, empathy, and logic. So really understanding how to build trust, and in some cases where you've lost it, how to rebuild trust. Can you tell me a story about that in action? Like, uh, how have you seen that little piece of magic happen? Oh, golly. So almost every time I give a talk, I just gave one two nights ago, and we have people do a self-diagnostic of what their, I call it a wobble, but which one is ailing them at a particular moment. And a gentleman in the audience who was shouting to everyone silently that he has an empathy wobble, but he was quite sure he had an authenticity wobble. So it was he was completely misdiagnosing himself. And then he came up to me and talked to me afterwards and was telling me why he was, you know, what he was going to do in the future. And I was like, I just stopped him. And I was like, and he was, I don't know how old he was, maybe 65. I was like, I think we can change the rest of your life if the only thing you think of for now on is empathy. And the way to think about it is that every sentence you're talking about has you or we in it and no longer has I in it. Hmm. And he looked suspicious, but then people around him who had known him were like, that's exactly right. And he's like, okay, I'll try it in a meeting I'm having tomorrow. And oh my gosh, <laughs> the like long, long letter I got afterwards of how this teeny pebble that had been there for 60 years has now been swept away because someone was able to shine a light on it in a way that he could see it. Wow. You gave a, gave quite a gift that not just to him, but to a lot of people around him. And how how um, horrifying is it at one level that someone, I, I think there are a lot of people in the world like this, I'm not going to name any names of any public figures, but who, who spend their, you know, their whole life thinking that they are not being authentic enough and that they just need more me time and, and people to really see the real them, when actually it's, it's like... Yeah, authenticity is all set. Yes. Let's go yeah. look at the other ones. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, so I have an expectation that people are mortal, 
So I don't condemn people for having wobbles. And I know how you overcome a wobble. You want to. That's the only thing I can't provide. So any of those public figures you're thinking about, I believe they could change tomorrow if they wanted to. I can't create the desire, but if you have the desire, we can take whatever boulders are in the way and make it a pebble and sweep it away. Okay, so so when you're present with someone, you, you build on trust, then, then what? And then the next thing is that in the book, we call it trust, love, and belonging. The second one, love, the way... The way that we think you can bring out the best in others, if you have a foundation of trust, others need to experience us as setting really high standards because it's hard to achieve our best in the presence of low standards. They also have to simultaneously experience our very deep devotion to their success. When you can do both of these things and you have that foundation of trust, people's improvement rate will just be crazy steep. Now, the challenge is that for most of us, when we set high standards, we start to get a little chilly towards people. And so people will experience our high standards, but not with deep devotion. And then maybe we get some feedback about that, and then we scramble over to being really deeply devoted, and we insidiously lower the standards. And then we get really fed up with ourselves for having done that, and we go back and forth and back and forth. And that's how a lot of people spend a lot of their lives. I mean, love is love is a, an unexpected word to show up in a leadership book, and, and it's, it's almost like it's a challenging word in some ways to use in work context. And I, I kind of love that you, you have it in there. I mean, is what you're talking about here essentially tough love, like being willing to show people tough love and that both parts of that phrase need equal emphasis. Yes. And so it's the phrase should be tough and love, (laughs) but tough love is actually a prescription for high standards, low devotion, and we don't like it. True love is when you have high standards and deep devotion. And then both of those become components of love. If you genuinely want someone to improve, I think we figured out what the two ingredients are, and we got there by studying ancient Rome and then seeing examples all throughout history up until it fuels some of the most successful companies in the world today. In my view, it's what fueled all of Netflix's growth. They had a culture based on high standards and deep devotion. So that's the second part. And I also think the word love is provocative but accurate, and we didn't want to change it because it's too provocative. And, and, and by the way, have you found that you can go in and talk to CEOs and they will they will resonate with that or do they get a little uncomfortable and think? Um, we conclude mm. with it. We don't start with it for the purposes that I think you're thinking of. Got it. And so the third part is belonging, did you say? Yeah. And so the thought there on belonging is that in our presence, it's our job to set the conditions for more people and more varied people to thrive. And historically, whatever organization, whatever team, whatever anything, has been pretty optimized for a certain set of demographics to thrive. And I don't want to take anything away from that. I just want to broaden it so that we can set the conditions for more people and more varied people to thrive. And so belonging is what are the very specific steps we take, and that's what we detail, so that everyone feels like they belong. It's not that the underrepresented feel like they belong a little bit less and the overrepresented feel like they belong a little more, or in some crazy instances, vice versa, but that everyone feels like they are of the place. It's part of what you're saying here that, that um, you know, a lot of companies in 2019 have made some kind of effort to diversify their, their workforces, but that they have actually only done part one of, of what's necessary and that it's, it's all very well to hire more diversely. But if you don't really go through the work of, of ensuring that people belong, that you, you have not realized the, the benefit of that. Indeed. I, and, you know, many things are called diversity and inclusion. I know the names are changing, but DNI. And I think the letters are in the wrong sequence. I think you have to have inclusion first. And that will beget diversity. And diversity needn't beget inclusion. In fact, I find that it vast majority of times it doesn't. And then you get on this treadmill of diversity that's neither very good for the company and is certainly not good for those that are different. Hmm. 
So start with inclusion. How how do you do that? How do you foster that sense of belonging? The first part is to understand how well you're doing now in a pretty granular way. So, for example, we don't have very many senior women at a company. Is it because of hiring, development, promotion, or retention? So is it that I can't find them to come to the company, or I can find them but they won't say yes? Is that once they get here, I don't know how to effectively develop them? Or I do develop them, but we're not promoting them. Or I get all the way through promotion, and then someone else poaches them. You can realize that if I just tried to solve the problem of there's not as many senior women in the company as, as there should be, the prescription varies for each of the diagnoses I just said. So it's being fearless about whichever diagnosis it is. I can give you very sound prescriptions about how to overcome each one. But unsurprisingly, they're very different from one another. So you have to get at which is the problem. And then realize that if you're never going to do it for race, could very well be different. And then if you're going to do it for LGBT, could very well be different. But the whole world of diagnoses, I think we understand. Now it's the clever prescriptions that get layered over them for each group we're talking about. And you would argue that you should do this not just because it's the right thing to do, because it will actually help the company achieve its goals. I think it will help the company be two, three, four X more effective. And if you do it with all your might, I think you'll be two times more effective within a year. In fact, I would give anyone that guarantee. And I think you will be much more effective than that in future years. Can you give us one example of that where you've actually seen that happen? Sure. I work with an organization called Riot Games. They were in some ways magnificently diverse except for when it got to the senior leadership, uh, race and gender were were not there. I started working with them, and we realized we wanted to hire a CHRO and a chief diversity officer as the first two hires. The quick calculus we had to do was, do we want to hire people we know, which is how most hiring goes on in the gaming industry, or do we want to find people we don't know? And my hypothesis was super clear— The quality of the people we don't know is higher than the quality of people we do know. Well, you know it's a great way to have to learn about the people you don't know? Look for women. Look for people of color. So then we go and do a search for the best women as CHRO, for the best women or people of color for the chief diversity officer. And it's not saying we won't hire a man to one of these roles. But as soon as I start looking for a man in a group that's used to looking for people we know, names of people we know end up on the list. What I really wanted the list to be titled are people we did not yet know. When you do that, oh my gosh, you get amazing quality. So WeWork has begun doing this, and the new people that they've been bringing into the organization are astoundingly good. Not surprisingly, far more demographically diverse than the existing population. What I hear you saying is that it's not enough for an organization that wants to be wise about this to just say, okay, we're not going to be biased in who we hire. We're just going to look out there for best qualified people regardless of where they're from. That's actually probably not going to get you there. You've got to actually consciously start by saying, we're going to hire someone who doesn't look like us and then be amazed at who you can find and what impact that they can have. I've never seen an organization that has the best athlete approach and that they have the highest quality people on their team that they could. And the way I know you don't have the highest quality people on your team that you could is if your team is homogeneous. Then you only fished out of a part of the pond. And if you had access to the entire pond, I'm sorry, probabilistically, it's impossible that only one small subset is where all of the best. So so Riot Games was um, ground zero for one of the original or for online flame wars that um, that in many ways, like in some people's view, almost paved the way for some of the dysfunction on social media today. You feel that your engagement um, in who was hired to the company and so forth, like did have you seen that um, move through and impact the sort of um, online environment around Riot Games? That's the intention. So if... If I wanted to go to Uber, because if we fixed it there, is nobody else can say, oh, our situation is too hard. Riot Games, again, filled with amazing people, 
the nobility of the purpose was unknown to me. I never played games. But then when I found out how rich a part of a life it was for a billion people in the world, I thought, okay, this matters to many, many people. And so what we first started doing is working internally. And I joined them when they had some internal, there was some press around some internal problems they had. And so I came in to be helpful there. But with the expectation that as soon as we get our legs underneath ourselves internally, it's how do we create the conditions for more and varied people to thrive in the entire ecosystem? And that's super exciting to me because if you think of a platform and how we can reach people, you know, my sons play games and I don't want them to grow up in a misogynist environment or a racist environment but I know full well who's going to be able to influence that are the game makers. And the folks at Riot get this completely. Just tell me one thing that was done to address those issues, and has it, has it made a difference? Yeah, the, so the metrics are going to be, time will tell is the only thing we can say there. But even things like having a player's council, where you can now report any behavior that goes on in any game you're playing. Just that, so it goes back to Amy Edmondson's beautiful work on psychological safety, and you have to make it safe to say, you have to make it safe to speak up, but you also have to make it technologically possible to do it. They now do that, and they have player tribunals. So you can't get away with as egregious behavior as you used to. But I think the Players' Council is a pretty amazing first step. Do you think there's any analog to that in social media more broadly? A lot of people obviously in agony over what's happening on Twitter and Facebook and so forth. Any analog? Yeah, I I mean, so I've never been on social media and I purposely stay off of it largely because I'm an introvert um, and I don't like distractions. Um, But I also don't like anonymous comments. You know, I care deeply about leadership and leadership doesn't happen in the shadows. I really believe in those Milgram experiments where you can set the conditions for people to behave badly. In some ways, all of this cloaking of ourselves is a little bit of a Milgram experiment in my mind. And I look forward to the people who think about it all day, every day, and I think they're very smart, learning how to fix the experiment so that we can bring out the best in one another. Um, I think we've learned how to bring out not the best in one another, and I look forward to folks really figuring out how to change that. I, of course, think it's entirely possible. So let's come back to this plan of making other people awesome. Um, You've talked about how to do it when they're with you. How do you let them leave the nest and um, be awesome without you? Yeah, so the, the first insight there is that strategy and culture are the two guides a company has for driving discretionary behavior. Any employee at any company is going to make dozens of decisions, micro decisions throughout the day. Nobody's watching. If those decisions are going to be in line with what the company wants, the company had up until that moment two levers to drive it for that person to understand the strategy so that that will guide it or for the person to understand the culture so that that will drive it. So for creating in our absence, we have to make the strategy well understood to everyone, and that means the greatest strategists in the world are constrained by how well they can communicate, and that culture is, I want to get into your mind so that the way you think reliably manifests in certain behaviors. So I think you have to get strategy in the minds of everyone first, and then I would say culture is whenever strategy is silent— Culture is what fills the space. Tell, tell me about that, because how, how do you actually, how do you create a culture that can do that and can fill that space and uh, step into the gap? Well, so first, to realize that you are creating a culture all day, every day, you may or may not have been deliberate about it. The culture exists because of what, you know, you and others are doing. You are giving people mental models all day, every day. Now, when they're confusing when you do one thing in the morning, it says the customers are always right, and then in the afternoon you say, but you have to hit your numbers, and you don't give people a way of bridging these two counter statements, then chaos is going to occur. But you're doing it. So once you realize you are 
you already are creating the culture. Now we want to create a deliberate culture where we are unwavering in our consistency about how we signal it. A great company, I think, that does this is TaskRabbit. TaskRabbit is, in many ways, the first gig company, and it's maybe the best gig company in terms of the the people that provide tasks. And it's just to, you know, do things like help. I want help putting together my IKEA furniture. The person who comes to my house is happy. I'm happy. It's like a beautiful ecosystem where both sides of the platform are deliciously happy. Uh, Stacy, the CEO at TaskRabbit, has figured out how for it not to be a fixed pie. That's from strategy, but then the culture. So Stacy is a tasker every quarter. She goes out and puts together people's IKEA furniture or helps them put up shelves, which makes other senior leaders want to do it. And so that has such a strong cultural signal. And she talks about what she learned as a tasker. So that's what I mean. Like, she had to get all of the pricing right and the strategy and who are we going after. That's the strategy. And the culture of humility and excellence, you know, pervades the organization. So what I'm hearing there is that is that strategy, you know, you can explain that. But when it comes to culture, it's much more about what you actually do. It's that, that's what people will pay attention to. What are you, what are you doing? Are you living this? If, if they see that you're authentically okay. doing that, then that culture can, can spread. Accelerate like crazy. Interesting. All right, so so let me see if I've if I've got if I've got this right. <laughs> your your recipe for leadership it's just it's not about you. Your number one goal is to make other people awesome, and that you can do that in your presence. You build it on trust first, and uh, and then love or toughness plus love, and then belonging. Those those three elements. And then beyond to to scale that, it's about getting the right strategy into the organization understood, and then living living the culture. And that somehow you put those pieces together, and um, some kind of wondrous magic can happen, and you can get an organization capable of really making a difference. And I can give you just the final advice on how to make it happen, which is, Anne and I wanted to call the book How About Now, but our editors, I think, rightly told us not to. But I've never seen anyone who's gone about change in retrospect, say, gosh, I wish I took longer, or gosh, I wish I tried to accomplish less. And yet, whenever we go about change, you may have instincts to delay. Certainly, everyone around you will have instincts for you to delay. So the only thing I can say about this is do all of it now (laughs) is a much better answer than this foolish notion that somehow the future will miraculously be better situated for change. So my final implementation advice is how about now? How about now? It's okay to risk a mistake. Don't let perfection or the, be, be, be an excuse. And I think that's a lovely way of saying it. And then I might say it in a more forceful way, which is as soon as you know that there are things like unequal access to you know, the upper echelons of the organization on your watch, if you delay, you delayed while you had the knowledge that it existed. And I think you have an obligation as a leader to start as soon as you know it. Powerful words, Francis Frey. Thank you. What a treat to talk with you. Thank you so much for this conversation. And good luck with the book. I think that's going to be hugely influential. I've loved the conversation in literally any time. Harvard business professor Francis Frey. Check out her TED Talk. It's called How to Build and Rebuild Trust, and you can find it at TED.com. Now then, if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider writing a short review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening. Those reviews are influential. We certainly read every one. Please also share it with anyone you know who might be curious about being a better leader. This week's show was produced by Lacey Roberts and Kristen Schwab at Transmitter Media. Our production manager is Roxanne Highlash. Our show is mixed by David Herman. Our theme music is by Alison Leighton Brown. Special thanks to my colleague Michelle Quint. I'm Chris Anderson. Thanks for listening. A quick note before I go we'll be taking a break for a few weeks. 
but we'll be back with the final episode of the season before the end of the year. I hope you'll join us for that.